we'll do a, we'll do, we'll take some questions and answers or whatever. So. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 Yes. Yes. That's why he said that about not not cutting the stone, not yeah, not fashioning the stone and, and things like that. Right. So that it wouldn't be like man's work. It would be God's work at the altar, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, so what chapter is that in? What chapter is that? Exodus 20. Actually, Miss Deanna, can you do me a favor? Can you go down to my my office and on my desk, bring me my big Bible, bring me my Bible? Yes, all the way down on the end. Thank you. Now, like in Solomon, yes. Yeah, no steps um, so that, I mean, like for practical purposes, if the wind blows, things like that, it can, uh, yes, young lady, yeah. Um, the wind blows and things like that, so that their so that their nakedness doesn't uh, appear, so they don't see they don't see their thighs, don't see their legs, um, and so in ex okay in Exodus twenty right, is, is that is that where we are you are, okay now if you notice this is not making this is not talking about we know this is not talking about the tabernacle, this was talking about just build it, having an altar, and having an altar before the tabernacle came. So during the year, because they came out of the they came out of Egypt, they go to Sinai, and while they're there, from that point for about a year, eight months, maybe twelve months or so, closer to about eight months, they're building the tabernacle and they're fashioning the tabernacle. And so at up to that point, God is telling them, I want you to build an altar, but make the altar out of earth, just a pile of dirt, and if you make it out of stone. Just bring rocks and pile the rocks on top. Don't cut the don't cut them. Um, the point about the stairs is this is actually like a reference to the height, the height of the altar. So let's you know, they have a bunch of dirt here and they have a pile of rocks, and it's not super high, but you know they got to throw the animal on you know, top of it or whatever. Uh, the point is is to have a way to get to the top of the altar, and so. It, it, don't make it out of steps, but you need to get to the top of it so they can make it like out of a ramp, um, a ramp of dirt and a, a, a mound of dirt, which some people think that even in the tabernacle itself, when they built the brazen altar right there at the front, that that very possibly on one side, there was a ramp of dirt going up to the top of that brazen altar. 
because they would they would lay the animal on top of the altar of the brazen altar, but there was there was a grate um, that went halfway. So you have the you have the altar, you have the the brazen altar, like this is the, the top of it, and then about halfway right here is where there would be a, a brazen grate, and the fire would be underneath it. The animal would be laid on top of this brazen grate. So there would be somewhat of a ramp leading up to it that they could um, put over. Now, when they built the tabernacle, I'm sorry, when they when they built the temple, if I remember right, there there are stairs in there, and uh, at least a scaffolding. It talks about that uh, Solomon is on a scaffolding when he is. Um, when he offers all of his sacrifices and makes makes that uh, big to do on that day about that, but yeah, that's a really good observation. Yeah, God, and this was um, this was what he wanted them to do before before the tabernacle was. And the whole point about you know what he says in Exodus twenty, uh, if you make it of stone, uh, don't build it of hewn stone. Don't don't carve out the stone. Don't shape it. Don't fashion it. And the point or the, the element there is to show us that the altar itself is a is the work of God. It's all natural stuff. You know, it's God's handiwork involved in that. And we just put it together. So that's a good question. Now, okay, I, I, I think that it would be not okay. <laughs> I'd say that. Um, now, what's very interesting about the tabernacle and the, about the temple. Now, as we've been going through the study on the tabernacle, the tabernacle was a part of the Mosaic Covenant. Okay, it was a part of um, what, the, the covenant that God made with Israel. So he brings them out of Egypt, which is a part of that Abrahamic covenant um, that I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bring you to this land. So they come to Mount Sinai. And so now God is going to make another covenant with the nation of Israel before they're getting ready to go into to Sinai or to, into the promised land. Now, part of the covenant, of course, with Abraham, there was circumcision. With the nation, now it stayed with the nation of Israel, but now there's going to be a new aspect of the covenant, and it is the Sabbath day, as that outward token and outward sign that you are my people. Well, within the Sabbath day is the law, okay? And so the law, the Ten Commandments, and everything else was a part of that covenant. Well, God, I mean, He knows they're going to break His law, He knows they're going to break the covenant. So within this covenant, though, he makes a provision for them, and that's through the tabernacle. Now, when we read the Old Testament or the New Testament, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ, or that the law, was a shadow of what was to come. It was a shadow of Jesus. So everything within the law, within that covenant, the Ten Commandments, the sacrificial system, the tabernacle, all of that points to Jesus Christ, okay? Which is why in the tabernacle, as we've done this study, it's very precise. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant is, you know, two, it's 47 inches long and 28 inches wide or whatever. The brazen altar is so high. The table of showbread is this big. The tabernacle is the, the most holy place is 10 by 10. The entire tent's like, uh, is, was it 10 by 30 or something? And, and there's all these precise measurements. And the reason is because Jesus Christ is precise. It's, it's a representation of, of, his, of his perfect humanity and his, as, as the God-man. Well, then when we get, I'm saying all that to say this, is that when we get to the tabernacle, there's no instructions about the tabernacle at all. Or, I'm sorry, the temple, Solomon's temple. There's none. Now, when we read Ezekiel, and we're getting to that heavenly tabernacle, I'm sorry, the heavenly temple, which seems to be the temple that's going to be during the millennial reign of Christ, is pretty precise. I mean, there's three levels, and you have windows, and you have this, and you have, and so there's very, that's very precise. But Solomon's temple, there's, there, there is none of that. Now, I think the reason, and now, what does Solomon do? He follows the tabernacle pattern. 
He has a brazen altar. He has a laver. Matter of fact, I think he has ten lavers. <laughs> you know, yeah. And so, and then he has a candlestick, and it's a gi- it's gigantic, from what I can tell. A table of showbread, an altar of incense, a gigantic veil, and then the and then the ark of the covenant on the other side. Now he follows the pattern. Now, what is significant about this is that the tabernacle is a definite picture of Jesus. But the temple, I, I think, is a, is a type of the people of God. Not of Jesus Christ, but of the people of God. And I think, again, as everything in the Old Testament is pointing towards the New Testament, the temple itself is a type of the Christian. Paul says that our bodies are the temple, and it's the exact same. It's the Greek word in the New Testament is equivalent to the Hebrew word for the most holy place in the actual temple. And so I think that, and I think the, the, the picture is that we, there is no, this is going to sound weird, there is no specific look in the temple. We just, the temple simply followed the pattern. It's the same thing in our lives. God is not, okay, like with Christ, the, that temple, that, that tabernacle rather, it had to be very specific. But the temple was not. And I think that the implication to you and I, to us as believers, as the temple of God, is that we have a pattern to follow. Th- that, that's it. We, just, we have a pattern. And um, there's nothing specific um, per se in our lives. Even, I mean, it's just to be like Christ. And it shows that there's, there's different levels of growth in everybody's life. You know, we're all, on the, we're all following the pattern of Christ. But it's it's not it's not specific, like for you and for me. I mean, it's because we're all at different levels in our Christian life, and so I think that that is the the principle or the point there with the tabernacle. Why there's nothing specific given. Now I I, I know I went around my elbow to get to my knee, but I don't think that they should have that there should be stairs in the temple going up. I think it should be a you know, more of a ramp instead of the stairs. You know, God says don't you know. I, you know, don't have stairs going up to my altar because I don't want your nakedness to be unco- to be revealed. Which is why, in the Old Testament, uh, we read that the priests wore breeches. You know, they were knee-length pants or whatever, knee-length shorts that came down to their knee to cover up that part of their nakedness. So, um, as they did service in the temple or the tabernacle of God, well, because of why? Well, the wind blows. You know, the breeze blows. So. You know, so does that answer to that? Okay, I hope so. Okay, any, anything else? Doing some, well, I'm taking questions today. I'm about ready to shoot my laptop. So all of my material that I have saved is gone. So I have to find it. Um, maybe so. Yeah, yeah, because God is very, yeah, and that, right. They had the stairs leading up to their altars, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting thing. I know we've been talking, we've talked about this before. You know, and maybe when we get done with the tabernacle, we might do a brief study on, on angelology slash demonology, how all this stuff fits together. But I was, I was reading through, I, I'm sure it was Exodus, Maybe it was Leviticus. I think it, maybe it was Leviticus, or maybe it was Numbers. When when you get to, um, I tell you what, I, we're here. Right, turn to Deuteronomy seventeen. Deuteronomy seventeen. Um, Deuteronomy seventeen. I think this is very interesting. Um, I, I don't have these these verses marked. I, I, I happen. I know this particular one, but I I don't have some of the other verses marked. But I've 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 always I found this as I'm going back and reading through the Bible this year. I just found something very intriguing. Did I say Deuteronomy? Okay, I'm sorry, Leviticus. I don't know. I'm looking right at it, and I said Deuteronomy. Go figure. Hey, Leviticus 17. I think this is a very interesting. Uh, thing when, And when you read the New Testament, you find that Paul 
is reiterating something very similar to this, that the, that the idols, the gods that the heathen worship, the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Philistines, okay, all of these, the Egyptians, uh, those statue gods were, were, were and may, may, may have actually been, and I'm going to say may have actually been, I'm not going to say right yet, but I might as well, but were demons, uh, some type of angelic being that revealed themselves to them. Now look at Leviticus 17, 7. Um, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. I tell you what, jump up to, um, look at, uh, go to verse number 2. We'll read the whole We'll begin with verse number 2, Leviticus 17. He says, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons and unto all the children of Israel and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp or killeth it out of the camp and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood. And that man shall be cut off from among his people. Now, he's not talking about just killing an animal to eat it. This is making reference to if a man kills an ox, a lamb, a goat, that the purpose of this is for a sacrifice. If he's not bringing it to the tabernacle, then he should be cut off to the end, verse 5, to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. So don't offer your sacrifices outside. Bring it to a specific place. Verse 6, And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a-whoring. This shall be a statue forever unto them throughout their generations. Now, what I find very interesting about this word unto devils, now we know that the context of Leviticus uh, um, of, Levitic, of, of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Whenever they offer these sacrifices unto the gods, or when they offer these sacrifices, they're offering them to gods. But God right here is pretty plain that he tells them, do not offer them to devils. Now, what is fascinating about this word devils, I was reading something by somebody, and they <laughs> said... Um, it was like a maybe a like a personal translation, you know. They were just interpreting the verse as they, they said it. They said, and you will no longer offer sacrifices unto goats. Okay. Okay. Why? Because the word devils right here means a hairy goat. It is a um a satyr. It is um a, the, the head of a, the body of a man with the head of a goat and the bo- and maybe even the lower the lower half as a goat but it's a goat slash and, and a man it's a, it's a, it is a satyr and so yes it is a it is a hairy goat the 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 devil the god the 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 god the the idol that they are worshiping in all likelihood, appeared like this he goat, uh, the, the 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 head of a goat and the body of a man, um, but God here is calling it a devil. Um, this is um, I don't want to necessarily say a demon, like an unclean spirit, but it is a devil. It is a it is a, a hairy one. It is is being worshipped. Now, what I find very interesting about that, and the reason I'm mentioning that, is that all of these even Dagon, the fish god, had the body of a man and the head of a fish. I'm not saying that this is what demons, or these devils, look like, just in their natural form. Um, but I'm saying that this is what they look like. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, um, Turn to, and I got this cross-reference here in my Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. I don't even know what Deuteronomy 32 says. Okay, yeah, Deuteronomy 32. I, I do know what it says. I have it cross-referenced. 
because and the reason I find it is I found that very interesting. It's, it's a, a, this devil is a goat, a he goat, a hairy goat, and you look it up in a Bible concordance or whatever. It's called it's a satyr. Now I know that's Roman and Greek mythology several thousands of years later, but this is Hebrew. This is you know a thousand fifteen hundred years before that. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, 32, verse number 16. This is just showing some more of the connection. It says, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. I know that gods right here in the King James Bible is in, uh, is in italics, but they, the implication is a strange god. With abominations provoked they him to anger. Now notice as they sacrifice unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers fear not. Now, the idea of this word, uh, of the word devils here, they sacrifice unto devils, uh, it, means, it means to swell up. Uh, the idea of they sacrifice unto devils here is, uh, it means to devastate, okay? Um, and the, the connection is, is that these devils, in verse 17, they sacrifice unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not. The connection is, is that the devils were the gods that they worshipped. And here, this word devil right here, the idea of it is to, to swell up or to bring, to, to bring devastation. Um, it's very possible, very possible, that the rituals... Of the of the heathen of the the sacrificing and the killings and all of these things that they did, I mean, because of the word devils here, the idea of it is to devastate, to bring devastation. And I don't want to take any gigantic leap. I'm not trying to read into something and sound silly or sound crazy or sound mystical or whatever. But I really think I really believe this that there is a strong possibility that the reason they would sacrifice to these devils to be worshipped by these devils is that these devils would bring about devastation to them, that they could, um, okay, so for example, Beelzebub, okay, that's the, um, if I remember, it's the Canaanite god, uh, and it means, Lord of, it means Lord of the flies, it means Lord of the dung hill in the New Testament time, and the idea of it is that this Beelzebub, this god, actually could expel flies away because then the flies are associated with death and it's associated with, with destruction or whatever. And so and they, so they worship Beelzebub. And of course, the Pharisees called Christ Beelzebub, the prince of Satan or the prince of the devils. And I think that Beelzebub is a, I, I think that he is Satan. I do think that. I think that he, that particular god, that God that they worship is the type of Satan. But the point is, is I think that these Canaanites and these people worship these beings and these gods because of something. Um, even, uh, you don't have to turn here, but if you want to just make another cross reference to this, is in Psalm 106, verse 36 through 38, it says, And they served their idols which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. And the word devils here is very similar, if I remember right, is very similar to the, the hairy one, uh, the goat, if I remember right. Um, I, didn't, I didn't mark that. But, but the connection in Psalm is the fact that they served, they sacrificed idols. They served idols and they sacrificed to devils. I think there's a connection there. Now, I'm saying all of that, and it's, somebody may say, Brother Dan, do you really think that these demons um, appeared, that these devils or whatever it is that they worship, maybe they're um, some type of, of God, do you believe that they appear to them? And, and I do, I do, and the reason is, and I cannot find the scripture verse now, <clears throat> if my life depended upon it. Um, um, maybe I will find it here. It's just one verse, which really, I guess, in a, is is the verse that 
is the verse that prompted me to say, you know what? This did happen. Um, and the verse is, I cannot believe I, I, I don't have this marked. I know I marked it. Um, the verse, I don't want to tell you what the verse says or what it means without you actually reading it. There are several verses that God is speaking to the nation of Israel, and he makes this statement. I, okay, he tells them, do not make, do not make uh, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto a, a graven image. Okay, don't make an image to worship the image. Okay, I find something very interesting. What, oh, here it is. Thank you, Lord. Deuteronomy 4. I knew that I would, I would find this. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, um, we don't necessarily see it here, okay? But what is it that God is always, always telling them? Do not practice after the abomination of, of, of the heathen. The, the, where you're, the land and where you're going, don't copy them. Deuteronomy 4, look at verse 14. We'll read several verses, and uh, I want you to see this. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourself. Now notice this. Listen to what God says. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, out of the midst of the fire. Now notice that. God is telling them, you didn't see me. You saw no similitude of me. Verse 16. Why not? Why did you not see a similitude of me? Why did you not see my shape or form? Verse 16. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male, check this out, or female. How many? Now, what are all of the idols? They're similitudes, they're images, they are reflections, male and female. Now, I don't. Uh, listen, I'm just going to say it. I don't, God, there's nothing in the Bible that reveals specifically that there are male and female angels. Every time angels are mentioned, they're always mentioned in the masculine. But I do find it very interesting that there are female gods that are worshipped. Now, maybe... Because we, 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 I know this isn't a big study, but we're making a little bit of a connection that the gods that they worshipped were devils. We've already seen some verses about that. Maybe the devils, when they revealed themselves to these people, revealed themselves as female. I don't know. But God says, you've not seen any image of me, the similitude of any figure, male or female. Verse 17, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars and even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Now, notice, I, just, I think this is so interesting to me as I study this out and read this more and more. God says, you've seen me. If, do you need to, is it cold? Are you cold? If you need to close that, y'all can close that door. Yeah. Because the heat will come on here in just a minute. Yeah, close, because I know that cold air is coming in through there. Uh, but what I think is interesting about, about this passage is that God is, is a spirit. And from what the Bible reveals, we, we, we cannot see God unless he allows us to see his, his essence. But what does he tell them to do? Don't, you've not seen me because I don't want you to make any image of me. But then he, he immediately begins to give them animals. Things that, things that what? They see. Things that they see. Why is that important or why is that significant? I think that it's significant because these devils... These idols, these gods that the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Egyptians and everybody else worshipped, I think they got the idea from somewhere. 
And I think they saw these creatures. And then we're going to look at one other passage in just a few minutes to describe angelic beings that still serve God and what they look like. Okay? Verse number 20, But the Lord had taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a, a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, and swore that I should not go over Jordan, and that I should not go in unto the good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, but I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that good land. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything, which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now, sometimes when we talk about this, I know this, that it is so easy to discount. Oh, come on, this is crazy. I mean, you think these demonic, these devils showed up to these people with the body of a man and the head of a goat. I do. <laughs> I do. Now, why do I think that? All right, turn to Ezekiel. Okay, now Ezekiel is probably one of the most fascinating books you can read in the Old Testament. Um, <laughs> if there was, <laughs> I say this laughingly, if there was ever a man that needed therapy after his visions, <laughs> and this this is the man that needed therapy after his visions. Okay. Uh, to 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 have seen the stuff that this this man sees is is interesting. Now I know there's some art, there's there's people that say, well, you know, these are just figures that he was in the spirit, and we don't know if he actually saw these things. Like that, like there are, there are people that that say that. Okay, um, I believe that Ezekiel saw these things. Whether he was in the spirit, like taken up to heaven or in, in spirit form like John the Baptist or like John the Apostle, he was taken up in the spirit, or Paul, you know, when he died and he was caught up to the third heaven. Um, well, he didn't know if he was dead or not, but verse number, uh, look at verse number four, Ezekiel 1 verse 4, Ezekiel 1 verse 4, and I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself. That would be weird, a fire enfolding itself. It's like burning, like almost like, like a sun, but it's, it's, it's burning within itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the mist thereof, as the color of amber, out of the mist of the fire. Also out of the mist thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And now these living creatures, they're, these are angelic beings. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. In other words, this is their body. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight. And the sole of their feet like the soles, the sole of a calf's foot. They had hoofs for feet. Their feet were straight. In other words, in other words, their legs were not bent. They're just hanging straight down. And their feet, they, they had the sole, the sole of a calf's foot. The, under, the underneath of them was like a hoof, like a calf. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings. So they had these wings, and then maybe they had wings, and they had hands hanging off of the wings, or maybe wings, and they just had you know arms that hang down with, with, with hands, like a man, under the wings on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. Now their wings were joined one to another. Okay, so we've got four creatures. And these four creatures had four faces, and their wings are connected to each other. So these four creatures, they're, these living creatures, they're all connected by their wings. Um, verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. They didn't, in other words, they didn't rotate around. They didn't turn. They just moved straight. They moved back, and they moved side to side. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion. On the right side, they four had the face of an ox. On the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies, and they went every one straight forward. Whether the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. And as to the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Now, 
<laughs> I don't want to, like I'm going to admit, I know this is on YouTube. We may upload this on YouTube, but I know there's the, the TV show, The Ancient Aliens, you know. Guys, I know I've talked about it before, but, you know. But in, the, and I, the only reason I mentioned that is because they, they talk about ancient civilization. And almost every ancient civilization talks about, you know, the people that came down from the stars, and almost every one of them talk about how they glow. Now, I'm not talking, I'm not saying that the ancient aliens, those that are watching this on YouTube, whatever, I'm not saying that the ancient alien, that that TV show, that it's real. That's not my point. I'm talking about the ancient cultures that are referenced, whether it be the Egyptians, the Canaanites, or whatever. They all talk about these bright beings that come down from heaven. Well, what does Ezekiel see right here? Their appearance like burning coals of fire. They're, they're, they're bright. Like the appearance of lamps. They, they, they were glowing. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Living creatures ran and returned as their appearance of a flash of lightning. That's all that I'm going to on the, on the, read on that. But this is the point, the point about these gods, talking about the, the, the altar, that God said, you know, no stairs, um, because the, the heathen, the Canaanites, and all these, when they would worship, they would have two stairs leading up to their altars. Really high up in the up, really high up, you know, elevated them. Uh, God says, "Don't don't do that, you know. If we're going to have it, you know, don't do it with stairs. You know, do it with earth, and it can be like a, a ramp. But I don't want it to be real high. Uh, that's not the point. Um, all of the devil, or these these gods that they worship, God under inspiration, or um, um, uh, Moses and the psalmist there, probably David in Psalm one hundred six, if I remember right." They all describe these gods, these idols, as devils. One passage, Moses says they're the hairy goats. That these devils are the hairy goats, the tears. Um, God lets us know that they, that these devils that they worship, they could and would bring devastation to these people. It seems like I don't want to. I mean, let me let me say back. Seems like it, because what the word devils means, it means devastation. Um, why didn't God reveal himself to them? Well, well, why doesn't God just reveal himself? No, we know he did through Jesus Christ, right? We know that, okay? But why doesn't he just do that? Well, he tells us why, because if we saw God for who he was, we'd make, a, we'd make an image out of him and we would worship him. Well, this is the connection. Where did, where did the Canaanites develop their idea of what their gods look like. I think they saw a similitude of those gods, of those devils. Um, well, I don't think devils can, I don't think, I, I don't think that devils and angelic beings will look like that. I think they're going to, you know, that's not how Gabriel looked. Well, I didn't say all of them are going to look that way. But what I am saying is what God reveals in Ezekiel 1 is that there are four living creatures, at least four of them, in heaven they have the body of a man, the feet of calves, the sole of their feet are like calves, hoofs, they've got wings, they've got hands attached, maybe attached to the wings themselves, or maybe they just have, they have hands, you know, um, with four faces, the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of, of a, a lion, and the face of an eagle. Um, you know, you look at some of the, the gods of the Egyptians, you look at some of the gods of, of the Canaanites. I mean, again, Dagon, the fish god of the Philistines, the body of a man and the fish, the head of a fish. You know, so um, that God, I, and I'm not saying that that is, that that is what they, that that is what they look like. OK, because none of us were there. But my, my point is, is that. Maybe they revealed themselves to these people in this fashion. Maybe because the Philistines is close to the border of the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe this god, this demon, shows up to them one day, honestly, to their leaders, like the, the face of a, a, a fish and the body of a man, and says, if you worship me, I'll give you, good, I'll give you food. I'll bless your shipping. Because they're right there, on, they're really close to the coast of the Philistines, or they're on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So maybe they did that. You know, I, I, well, what would be the purpose of that? The same purpose... The same purpose as it has always been to take worship from God, to be worshipped, uh, to 
to, to use that to use that power. So, uh, and, and there's other instances in the scripture that we can look at when you look at Moses with Pharaoh. He throws his, his rod down; it turns into a serpent, and the magicians use their enchantments, and they do the same thing. That wasn't a parlor trick. That wasn't like sleight of hand. They took the rod, their rods, and threw it on the ground, and their rods turned into serpents as well. And so the, um, and so it, it wasn't, um, it was not a, a little magic, tr- like a little sideshow thing. It was for real. Um, there's actually, um, I, I was thinking of a scripture, uh, another verse of scripture of, of a, a divination. This is another reason why God is is against the. You know, like witchcraft and against uh, like necromancy and, and reaching out to the dead, trying to communicate with the spirit world and these types of things like that, because it is it is real. I mean, they're they're there. So, um, but anyway, I, I hope that I mean I know that's something different, but that's been in my mind, and so I kind of uh, there's some other other things about this that Paul mentions in principalities and powers. How it seems like some of the of the demons, um, maybe they have are these these um, these devils, these gods that are worshipped. Maybe there's certain places where they have control and power that God has given them to have dominion over certain areas. And I think about the uh, the the man with the unclean spirit in Gadara. Those demons, the legions of demons, said, "Don't send us out of this country." I think that's very interesting. Why is that? Well, we don't we don't know. It's not revealed. But when we take some other things from the Word of God and we look at Daniel and how God sent the answer by Gabriel to Daniel, but on the way the prince of Persia stopped him, and then Michael, the prince of Israel, comes and defeats him, defeats that prince of Persia, and then Gabriel brings the answer. It, it seems like well, maybe there's low locations where they do their their dirty work or you know I won't say their dirty work per se but places where God has given to them um, where they were supposed to um, take care of the people of God and to serve God but they desired the worship instead and there's a lot of I know there's a lot of different things that sounds kind of a bit like some mythology there you're getting into Greek mythology and Norse mythology and Roman mythology and all of this, but um, I I think that there are some things in the Bible that may actually reveal some of that. Not that the Greeks and the Romans and the and and Norse that that's true. <laughs> that's not not true. But these this idea of these different beings that were intended to serve man, but they they have rebelled against God and they desire the worship of God. They desire to get that worship. And we seeing here with the nation of Israel within the tabernacle, there were set, set ways to do it. And a lot of that reason is because it was contrary to what the um, nations around them did. You know. So are there any other qu- uh, questions about that or thoughts about that at all? I mean, anything at all? It's Ephesians 6. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. There is spiritual warfare. Yes. Yes. They turn the blood to water, the water to blood. Yep. They were, yes, the magicians in Moses' time, those men, I know they did the rods, and I think they did the first three plagues. They were able to, 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 to do and pr- to bring about the first three plagues as Moses, but then they were not able to do the next plague or any of the plagues after that, and that's when those magicians told Pharaoh, okay, Pharaoh, this is really the hand of God. 
and we can't do this, there is, a, there is another, there is a more powerful being that is doing this. And it's not ours. We can't do this. As a testimony that God is, and it's very interesting, you mentioned that about the, about that, and I think it's in Deuteronomy, and I don't remember the reference off the top of my head, but God declares that the ten plagues were plagues against the gods of Egypt. Okay, so we're making all the connections. These gods are devils. And um, there were ten of them, ten plagues. And so we know that the Egyptians had more than these ten, ten idols, these ten gods. Um, and I was watching something where this person had this vision that the gods of Egypt showed up to them. And if I remember right, it was, it was maybe nine gods or, or ten gods from Egypt that showed up to them in this vision. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. The, uh, what I'm finding interesting is how that these plagues were direct attacks against these particular gods, these devils. And I really think that these gods and these devils had the power to bring about these exact things, but God, he, he showed his power over them, that their gods, they couldn't stop what God was doing. Well, of course, because God is almighty. I mean, he's all-powerful, and we know that. But I think that there's a connection there, again, that these Egyptians, and they, they worship, they worship these devils. They, and I, I mean, I, I don't think it was just some figment of their imagination. Oh, I know. Let's just make up a stone. Now you read the new, te- the Old Testament though, and there are times where Israel does that. In Judges, this guy just made a rock. He just made a statue. He started worshiping it, and he got everybody else to follow along with him. Well, when you're reading the passage, it's obvious that the guy really doesn't believe that this statue, this idol, has any power. He's using it, though, to get power and to get people to follow him. So that does happen. In the Old Testament, we see that where people just make up a god. Oh, here we go. This is who did it, so we're going to worship him. You know, we do see that. But I think that as we're reading the Old Testament, especially the beginning, we really find that these nations serve these real gods these devils these hairy ones these devastating ones um and so they they worship them and there's a, i was reading about some other ones this morning that i'm going to you know, look into molech and chemosh and some of the other ones you see um you can get some pretty crazy stuff when you look into some of this but um I, I, I believe that. I mean, I think they're probably some type of devil that these people saw and they worship them for different reasons. It's a good, I mean, that's a good, a good thing that you, you brought up. Uh, any, any, any other questions on this? Anything else? I, yeah. Sure. The pyramids, right. Like a ziggurat, yep, yeah, the Tower of Babel, yeah. He came on he came down on the mountain, a high place to copy that, yes. Yes. Right. Sure. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That the ziggurat, the ziggurats, or ziggurats, or whatever, and and you know Central America, South America, over the Middle East, or whatever, the pyramids. They all look about the same. They're all shaped the same, and they're all very high, and they're all reaching up to heaven. They all look like mountains, and yeah, and that's where God met with. Met with Moses was on top of the mountain at a high point, and there, I believe it. I think that it's the, the I believe it's Satan, and I believe it's the devils uh, are trying to mimic mimic God. So, right, they want worship. That's absolutely right. That's right. Yeah.
That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to uh, you don't have to draw a pentagram. You don't have to do that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah, that's right. There's only one way. There's only one way to heaven. That's right. Any other questions about that? Anything? Yes. Yeah, sure. No, I think that the devils, that the, the gods that they worship in Canaanite and Philistia and Egypt, all of those gods, because I do believe that they're some type of devil, some type of, an, when I say angelic being, I don't mean like a good thing. I, I, they, they are a spirit being. I'll put it that way. Um, there is no reason to think that they're not here. And that's why I think in Ephesians 6, when Paul says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, you know, the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, those are terms that are used to describe geographical locations. And they're terms that are used to describe, like, different levels of authority and control. So I have no doubt that whatever spirit being that Dagon represent, represented to the Philistines is still very much alive working in this world today. Bathomet, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, no, yeah, the text said that, yes, the Bible says that new God. Now, uh, the context is um, not, not new gods in the sense of, oh, hey, this is a new one over here, but new in the sense of they didn't know them. And so now they're worshiping these new gods, you, you see. Uh, but even, no, 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 God is, th yes, God would, well, God would have created right. Yes, you know, Joseph Smith saw the angel Moroni. I am still, I, I, I'm still convinced he saw something. I don't, I do not deny, I don't doubt that. I and mean, there was a time when I thought, oh, this guy's just crazy. Because he was a gold digger, and I need no doubt about it. The man was, he was, he was a crook, he was a con artist like Charles Russell of the Jehovah's Witness. Very much so, I mean, he was a gold digger, he sought treasure, I mean, he was not a good dude. But I think... But I also think, though, that, uh, but I believe that he saw something that revealed themselves to Joseph Smith, and he, he bought into it, and he just started writing whatever this angelic, this being began to tell him. So why for, you know, the last, I don't know, 1,500 years, uh, 1,300, you know, 1,600, 1,700 years, why has the church always just taught that these statues, that that's all they were? They're just dumb idols. Now, the Bible reveals that they're, that they're dumb idols. Now, actually, in the Psalms, it says you pray to these idols. They have ears that can't hear, eyes that can't see, mouths that can't speak, Um but that's the thing, it's just an image, and God is right. The image doesn't speak, the idol is, is false or dumb. Right, like a Buddha, it, it's not responding back, um, it's not responding back to you. But obviously, as we read the scripture in the New Testament, I didn't even get to the New Testament where Paul says, they that sacrifice to these, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, I think it is, they that sacrifice to these gods, are, they're actually sacrificing to devils. I mean, Paul in the New Testament says that. So why has the church veered off from that? Now, I can't say a couple of thoughts. One, there has always been within church history people that have taught kind of what we're going over today. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's there. It is. Um, I think the reason, though, on the other side of it, why is it not taught as much is, one, is because it's mystical. It's mystical. Um, and I think, two is honestly, is we, we, we just don't understand it. We don't, we don't fully understand it. Um, we, 
we go in, we, we go to the Bible, and there's, okay, there's nothing wrong with this, and there's really nothing wrong with doing this. But we, we enter, we, we take the Bible, and we open it, and when we do, we open it with pre, preconceived ideas already. And so when I read the text, like we just read, they're worshiping these devils, they're worshiping the gods, I don't even, <clears throat> I don't even pay attention to that. It doesn't even stand out to me that they're worshiping devils. I see that they're worshiping God. Because I enter into the text with a preconceived idea, a presuppositional perspective that is just an idol. Um, but then when we step back and actually just let the Bible speak for itself, let it just say what it says, and accept what it says, don't try to explain it away, then, oh, well, then this opens up a whole nother perspective of some things that I didn't really know and I didn't see before. And that's a good point. Maybe maybe if they're teaching on this, you know, we would we would um, become so wrapped up in these demonology that we would lose sight of Christ. And this is the thing, and maybe you know, maybe maybe so. I, I'm going to say you know, even with that, there's the possibility of that happening with anything, you know. But it's very possible. Maybe that's maybe they didn't want that. Um, I think that, but I think a lot of it is is because it is so mystical, and we just don't understand it. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I I I remember hearing the same thing that you know people would say would preach or whatever. Hey, this is, you know, this this Dagon was nothing but a statue and the Philistines worshipped him and that's all that he was. He had no power. Yeah, they had no power, you know, and they had no power. And then, well, what about the story of Moses? Well, then it would be this. Well, they just use tricks. You know, they sleight of hand. You know, you can't sleight a hand of stick turning into a snake. You know, I mean, there's things that magicians, you know, these guys, you know, they can do certain stuff, slide a hand, and tr- I, I get all of that, but you, you, you don't slide a hand that. You don't slide a hand, I'm turning this water. I remember that. I remember the cartoon, Prince of Egypt, from years ago, you know, and they're showing Moses, and then they show the magicians of Egypt, they turn around and they take this thing and they break his capsule and pour it in the water, and it turns red like blood. You go, no. I know it's, it's man-made, but and I know why they do that. It's to show, hey, they're, they're just making it all up. God is the one with the real power. This is, again, this is my point, though. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares if it's just a trick? God's not showing any power over that whatsoever. You, you see what I'm saying? There's, there, that, that's why he had his, his rod, Moses' rod, the serpent, eat the other snakes. To show I have power over you. You know, you can copy this. You have power to do that, but I will devour you. <laughs> you know, you see what you see what I'm saying? I hope that makes makes sense. If it's really if it's something's real, right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, yeah, the, the, the things of the Old Testament, they are not just, they were not just sticks and stones. Yes, the little idol itself, you know, man-made. Yes, the idol itself, it couldn't hear, it couldn't speak. God says you're worshiping these idols, and they were, they were worshiping the idols, yes. Um, but like we just read, though, there's parts of the Old Testament that reveal to us that these idols, these gods were actually devils. Paul himself, even Paul says it. And I know sometimes we read stuff in the Old Testament, and we're like, well, you know, but then when we read in the New Testament, Paul, the apostle, he makes the same um, the same comment. Um, he's, um, in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partake of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice by... That which is offered as sacrifices <clears throat> to idol is anything. He says, is the idol anything? Well, no, the idol's nothing. 
what about whatever is offered to that idol? Is it anything? No, it's not anything. But listen to what he says. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. The end of verse 21, ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Now, the the reason you know I'm mentioning that is that Paul, during his time, was saying that the Gentiles are offering things to the devils. He just made the connection. Idols, they're nothing, but understand when you offer it to this, this rock, this stick, you're actually offering it to a devil. There's a devil behind the idol is the point, you know. And so, um, you know, why, I, I, I guess it's, you know, why didn't, why, why didn't preachers, you know, preach on it and try to explain it? It's mystical. Maybe they, it's, it's too far-fetched. It's getting into things that we don't know a whole lot about, you know. And I get it. I, you're right. We don't know a whole lot about it. But this is what the Bible reveals. And so let's just accept what the Bible says and just accept it. And we don't. Right. How do we not see it before? Yeah. And I'm going to I'm going to tell you I'm, I'm going to tell you. I will tell you the reason why I did not see it. And it's because of what I said a few minutes ago. Pre, the big word is presupposition. I'm going into the Bible with a preconceived idea. Of something. So that when I'm reading it, I miss. What's there and I'm only seeing what I know to, to look at. And I only know to look at the idol and not the devils associated with the idol. You know. So, I mean, that's a good question, you know, concerning this. You know. Sure, yeah. Right, yeah, the greatest lie the devil ever told us he doesn't exist, sure. Right, yes. Right, God has given them authority, that's right. Yeah, that's right. 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 Sure. Sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Well, you get desensitized to things that's not right. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Right, sure. 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 Right. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. There's a double bind. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You don't stand. That's right. Yeah, it's revealed. And it's not even hidden. I mean, it's not like, it's not like, oh my goodness, I, God's hiding this from us. No, it's right there. It says it right there. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. All righty. Anything else? We'll we'll be finished. Thank y'all. That's some good questions, good discussion today. We'll go ahead and end there.